Okay, today we're going to talk about beats. Beats, uh, beating is a phenomena that you get when you add two sine waves together that have similar frequencies. So here's the basic idea. Imagine you have a speaker that is playing a sine wave at some frequency. This is a plot of the pressure reaching your ear as a function of time. And it's oscillating sinusoidally, thanks to the speaker. But what if we had a second speaker that was making a sine wave at a slightly higher frequency. All right, so I'm going to plot that now. So red is the sig is the wave from speaker number one, and black now is the wave from speaker number two. And you see that they are oscillating. Uh, they're both oscillating sinusoidally. And initially, you see the speakers are both oscillating together, right? They're in phase with each other. But as time goes by, the black wave it's a little bit higher in frequency, so it gets ahead of the red wave, and eventually the two waves are 180 degrees out of phase with each other. As time keeps going, though, eventually the black wave is so far ahead that it's behind. In other words, by the time I get to the middle here, the black wave has oscillated by one complete oscillation more than the red wave, and they're back in phase with each other. All right, so what do I hear? I hear the sum of these two waves. Over here, the two waves will interfere constructively and make a loud wave, a loud sound. Here, whoops, here the two waves will be out of phase with each other. They'll add destructively and I'll get little sound. Over here they're back in phase again and I'll get loud sound and so forth. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get a wave. When I add these two waves, I get this wave here. And you see it looks like a sine wave, but its amplitude is getting bigger and smaller. All right. So when you listen to two sine waves at nearly the same frequency, it sounds like one sine wave that's getting louder and softer. Now how fast does it get loud and soft? How long does it take for the waves to get in and out of phase with each other? Well, um, we can use the same trig identity we used for standing waves to figure that out. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to write our wave. So we have our wave that's coming to our ear, and it's a sine wave at some amplitude, at some frequency, say omega 1t, plus another sine wave at the same amplitude, but at a slightly different frequency, omega 2t. When I apply this uh, trig identity, I find this is equal to 2a cosine the difference of the two, that's going to be omega 1 minus omega 2 over 2 times t, then the average sine of the average. That's going to be omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2 t. If we look at this, this right here is just a sine wave oscillating at the average frequency. This right here though, if the two frequencies are nearly the same, this cosine is going to oscillate at a very small frequency, right? And so you can kind of think of this whole thing right here as being the amplitude of our oscillating sine but the amplitude changes slowly in time. Okay, how fast does this amplitude change? Well, there's the frequency right there, right? But at what frequency do we hear beats? All right, you might just take this thing right here, omega one minus omega two over two, and say, well, okay, that's angular frequency. If I want the, the B being in cycles per second, maybe I just change that to frequency one minus frequency two over two. Well, first of all, we don't care about the sine of this, so we're going to take the absolute value, all right? But there's another problem. Cosine does not oscillate between 0 and 1. It oscillates between 1 and minus 1. So as I look at a cosine, right, my amplitude's going to be big when cosine is 1. It's going to be small when cosine's near 0. It's going to be big again when cosine is negative 1, all right? So for every cycle that the cosine goes through, we actually get two beats. We get two pulses of loud sound. So we have to multiply this by two, and it turns out the frequency at which we hear beats is just the absolute value of F1 minus F2, the absolute value of the difference in frequencies. Even though there's a two here, we get two beats per cycle. So that's the beat frequency right there. Now this is reminiscent of when we did standing waves, right? How far apart are the nodes in standing waves? they're half a wavelength. Why? Because we did a trig identity and there was a 2 in the bottom, all right? But we did the trig identity and we said, look, 
here's what my wave looks like at some time. Sometime later it looks like this, right? So here's one wavelength, but the point is I have a big standing wave when cosine is one, but I also have a big standing wave when cosine is zero, so my nodes ended up being not a wavelength apart, but half a wavelength apart. It's a similar phenomena here, right? We had this one half in our cosine, but we get a beat twice per cycle. We get a beat when cosine is one and when cosine is negative one, so it turns out that the beat frequency does not have that two in there, it's just the absolute value of frequency one minus frequency two. All right? Okay, what does that sound like? What do beats sound like? Uh, I'm gonna play a sine wave of 440 hertz for you right now. Okay, that was a sine wave at 440 hertz. Now I'm gonna play one at 441 hertz. They sound very similar, don't they? But what happens if we play them both together? Let's do that again. All right, so while the two of them are playing together, we heard beating. We heard the sound get louder and softer. At what rate did we hear the beating? How fast? How, what was the time between the beats? Let's listen one more time. One with that, two with that, three with that. Okay, so it seems that there's about a second between beats, which means the beat rate is one hertz, and that's exactly what we expected because one hertz is exactly the difference between our two frequencies. Beats are really useful. You can use them for a lot of things. If you've ever played in a band or an orchestra, you probably learned to use beats to tune your instrument. If you and your stand partner are playing the same note, but you're not quite in tune with each other, you'll hear beats between your instruments, and you can adjust them. Uh, you can adjust frequencies to make the beats go away, and when the beats are gone, you're in tune. We also use them in precision measurements. I do some precision measurement work. And for example, imagine you wanted to measure the wavelength or the frequency that a laser beam is oscillating at. That frequency is too high to measure directly. Light oscillates too fast for any of our detectors to detect how fast it's oscillating directly. But if I have a laser beam that I've locked to some atomic resonance or something so I know exactly what its frequency is, I can take another laser beam and beat the two of them together and by looking at the beating I can figure out how close those two lasers are to being the same frequency. All right? You could also use it to detect Doppler shifts, right? So if you're building a device to measure how fast cars are moving by bouncing radio waves off of them, if you take the wave you sent out and mix it with the wave that's coming back, add the two of them together, you'll get beats. And from the beat rate, you can determine how much the frequency was shifted by. So basically, anytime you want anything fast to appear slow, if I have two fast, if I have a fast signal and I can compare it to another fast signal, I can use beats to figure out the difference between the two. This is known as heterodyne detection. It turns out that beats have a lot to do with music. So next time we're going to talk about the physics of music, and what we're going to discuss is the fact that beats determine whether chords sound consonant or dissonant. If you play a chord, if you play a seven chord, you know, that's, they use those in, I don't, if you don't know much about music, seven chords are used in jazz a lot. They build a lot of tension. They're a tense sounding chord. Reason for that, there's a lot of beats in them. If you want to play a pleasant chord, you want no beats to show up in your chord. But it turns out that it's impossible to tune an organ or a piano such that all of your chords that are supposed to sound nice will have no beating. All right, and the reason for that is, let's say I play an organ pipe and it produces some frequency FA, all right? So the note that it's playing is FA. This is the fundamental frequency of that organ pipe which determines, you know, which note it is. Is it an A or a G or whatever? But in addition to the fundamental, when we play the organ pipe, we also get the harmonics, two times FI, FA, three times FA, four times FA, and so forth. Now imagine we play another note, all right? We sound another pipe, and its fundamental frequency is FB. Well, we also get two times FB, three times FB, and four times FB, and so forth, all right? Well, these two 
organ pipes have very, or they're different notes, right? So the two frequencies are probably going to be fairly different. And if the frequency difference is big enough, our ear, I mean, you can still do the math. You can either think of it as two sine waves added together, or you can think of it as one sine wave with a beating amplitude, all right? But it turns out that our ear, does, it, it kind of makes a choice. If the two frequencies are different enough, our ear will interpret that as two different frequencies, and it sounds fine. If they're exactly the same, our ear hears it as one frequency with a constant amplitude, and everything sounds fine. But if our ear hears two frequencies that are close enough together but not exactly zero, we will hear beating. So probably, if I'm playing two notes, two different notes, the fundamentals will have very different frequencies, and our ears will hear two different frequencies. If I compare this harmonic to this harmonic, they're probably very different, and our ears won't hear any beating. But maybe, for example, it so happens that the third harmonic of this note and the second harmonic of this note are very close together in frequency, and so we hear beating, it sounds dissonant, it doesn't sound pleasant. Well, we can tune these frequencies a little bit to make these two exactly the same frequency, and we can make the beats go away, and then this will sound much nicer. But it turns out, as we'll find out next time, you cannot come up with a fixed scale for your organ or your piano or your guitar such that all intervals and all chords and all keys have no beating. All right, so you have to make compromises. We'll talk about that next time. But for now, I want to end off with a, a cool problem that kind of applies beating to do something interesting. All right, so this is a problem you can solve two different ways. And here's the problem. A speaker emits a sine wave with a frequency f. The wave reflects back off of a wall. As you walk from the speaker to the wall at a velocity, well, let's call it vw, because we're going to have the speed of sound in here. So let's adjust this. At velocity vw, it gets louder and softer. At what frequency do you hear the sound level pulse? At what frequency do you hear it get louder and softer and louder again? All right? Well, there's two ways to work this problem. The first way is to say, well, look, I've got two waves traveling in opposite directions here. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get a standing wave. I'm going to get a standing wave. And my standing wave, as I walk past my standing wave, all right, at velocity v walk, the sound will get louder and softer because if I'm standing at an anti-node, I hear a lot of sound. But if I'm standing at a node, I don't hear a lot of sound. So to figure out how long it takes between pulses of loud sound, I just have to figure out how long it takes me to walk from one antinode to the next. All right? Well, the antinodes are spaced a distance apart of lambda over 2. All right? I wasn't given lambda in the, home, in the problem. I was told to use f. So I'll just remember that lambda is the velocity of sound over f. So that means that the antinodes are spaced a distance of v over 2f apart, right? How long does it take me to walk from one antinode to another? It's just distance divided by velocity, and the velocity is how fast I'm walking. All right, so I plug d in here, and I'm going to get v over 2f v walk. All right, so the frequency of the pulses, the frequency at which it gets loud, right, is just 1 over the time. So that's going to be 2f v walk over the velocity of sound. So there's the answer to the problem. Very straightforward, I hope. But there's another way to work the problem. Another way is to think in terms of Doppler shifts. Instead of thinking of a standing wave, let's just imagine that I've got these two waves, but because I am walking, because I'm walking this way, what the, the wave coming from the wall is going to be Doppler shifted up in frequency, but the wave coming directly from the speaker is going to be Doppler shifted down in frequency, and I will he hear beating between those two frequencies. All right? So the, once again, the source is not moving. It's the observer that's moving. The observer velocity is VW, right? So for the wave coming from the wall, I'm going to get, let's call it frequency wall. So this is what I hear coming from the wall. It's the frequency of the wave Doppler shifted because I'm walking into it. So that's going to be V plus V observer over V, all right, which is F times V plus V walking over V. All right, 
For the one coming directly from the speaker, what I'm going to hear is a Doppler shifted wave. It's going to be the frequency the speaker's moving at. But now I'm moving away from it, so I'm going to subtract the velocity of the observer. All right? So the beep frequency, which is the frequency of the pulse as we found before, it's just going to be the absolute value of the difference of those two. But that's just going to be equal to, well, let's see, I take this minus this, the F can come out front, the V can come out front, the 1 over V, and then I'm just left with V plus V walk minus V minus V walk, and that turns out to be F over V times, that cancels with that, and then I just get 2 V walk. All right, there it is. And what did we get before? 2 F V walk over V. 2 F V walk over V. So we got the same thing. Two different ways to work the same problem. Now, I worked this problem to illustrate a few things. First of all, you can do cool stuff with beats, all right? Another reason, though, is to point out that physics is just this, I mean, there are lots of different ways to look at things, but we're using the same fundamental laws of physics. So however we look at a problem, if we work it right, we should get the same answer. And I think that's one of the coolest things about physics, is that there's not just one right way to look at a problem. The physics is the same, even though we're thinking about it very, very differently. Another reason is to, that, I, that I showed you this example is to point out that sometimes there are more than one way to look at the problem. And when there are, you can work it more than one way and check your answer and maybe catch some mistakes. If you have a misconception that applies to one way of working the problem and not the other, you'll get a different answer and realize you made a mistake. So it's a good way to check your work on homework and exams and real life.